Well, this morning what I'd like to do <clears throat> is begin by reading in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, which is a text that we'd be more apt to read on a Christmas morning for a Christmas service uh, because this is talking about the announcement. Um, in, in this case, to, um, well, to um, uh, Joseph that Mary is going to bear a child. But what I want us to focus on this morning is who this child actually is. We know that Mary is going to bear a child, which means that this is going to be a human being that's coming into the world, uh, the human nature of our Lord Jesus. But we want to note the name of this individual and why he is called by this name, Emmanuel, which is, you know, as, as you know, many of the, the names in Hebrew are really nothing more than sentences. This is actually two Hebrew words put together. You know, the word El refers to God, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the prefix in front of it talks about being with, God with, God with us. Uh, and that is who this child is. Uh, God with us. So let's read about it in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. By the way, the word Jesus is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word Joshua, which is essentially another sentence in Hebrew. Uh, Yah is the shortened version of Yahweh, and Shua is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. You shall call his name. Jehovah is salvation because he will save his people from their sins. By the way, that's just another evidence that Jesus is Yahweh. He is going to save his people from their sins, and that's exactly what Jesus did. Now, verse 22 now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. So again, this morning, we're looking at Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is God and man. And it's important that he be both because if he wasn't both, he could not save us. Only a God-man can actually save us. This evening, we're going to look at what he did to save us. Well, as you know, we've been looking at the fundamentals, the non-negotiables of the gospel. And the first, of course, is that the Bible is the Word of God. It's God's Word. Every word is His Word. Every word is exactly what He intends or He intended to tell us. Every word has His full authority. And since it is His Word, the Bible must have the first and the last word in everything that has to do with God, what it is we are to believe about Him, and what is right and wrong, how it is we are to live. The second non-negotiable, the second fundamental is that there is but one God. We do believe in monotheism, only one God. All the other gods, of course, are false gods. We're going to see that in a moment. Uh, this God is the same God that we see in nature, the one who reveals himself in nature, who is, as we saw, unlimited in every way, unlimited in his being, unlimited in time. He's eternal and unlimited in space. He is omnipresent. Unlimited in power, he is almighty. Unlimited in knowledge, he knows all things. And he is also infinite in his holiness and justice, but also in his goodness and his mercy and his truth. And that which is unique about the God of the Bible, the God that we serve, the God who uh, came down and visited us, is that he is three in person. 
The Bible speaks of three distinct persons who are each called God, who share the same characteristics and attributes of God, who do the works of God, and who are worshipped as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are not the same person. They are three separate persons, but they are all the one God. Now, the third fundamental we saw last week is that God made everything, the God that we are, uh, the only God who exists, the triune God. And remember, the work of creation is the work of the triune God. The Father is the one who speaks the word, let it be. The Son is the word of God. He is the creative word who comes forth from the Father. And the Spirit is the active agent who takes that word and puts it into motion. The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters and he was organizing the stuff that God created on day one into a cosmos, into an orderly universe. Now we saw, perhaps even more importantly, because God made everything that there is, everything, everything is a creature, basically. It's a creation of God. That's what creature means. Everything is accountable to him. We are accountable to God. We don't belong to ourselves, we belong to Him, and we one day have to give an account. Now, we are particularly answerable to God, as we saw last week as well, because we were made special. We were made in the image of God, one of two creatures made in His image. Remember, the other creature are the angels. And that image is not our bodies, that image is in our souls. We are like God in many different ways, but we also saw that we rebelled against Him in Adam. We sinned against God. We lost the precious influence and ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our hearts. We have corrupted hearts. We come into this world guilty and under the sentence of hell. And that's where we would be unless the Lord had had mercy upon us. And that's where the world is, those who have not trusted in the Savior. Now that brings us to the fourth fundamental this morning, which is the good news. Now, the bad news was that one portion that we looked at, uh, our condition because of Adam's sin, because of his rebellion against God in the garden, because of what that did to us, because of our sins. We are under the condemnation, the sentence of death and hell. That's the bad news. But the good news, the gospel is this, what God did to save us. Now, we need to realize the Father could justly have left all of us to die in our sins, and he could have punished us forever in hell. He could do that and be just because that's what we deserve. Justice is simply getting what you deserve. But that's not what he did. Out of his infinite goodness and love that we saw was an attribute of God. He sent his son into the world to live and to die and to rise again from the dead so that all who trust in him would not perish in hell forever, but have eternal life. Now this morning we're going to consider who this Jesus is that the Father sent into the world. The one we talk about every Lord's Day. I think often we think about him merely as a man, though a very special man, but we do need to remember he's more than a mere man. He is God, and he is man, and he needed to be both as I've said, in order to save us. Now this evening, as I've said also, we're going to look at what he did to save us, but this morning we do want to consider who our Savior is. Now first, this Savior the Father sent to save us is God the Son, the second person of the triune God. Remember, we looked at the Trinity and so forth. Now, by the way, we're going to look at a lot of passages this morning, which is why I was trying to kind of move things along because we have a lot of things to look at. So... Um, do pay attention to, to the screen. Now again, we read in our passage this morning in Matthew 1, 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. By the way, that was a fulfillment of a prophecy given through Isaiah, Isaiah 7:14. Uh, this is the fulfillment of it. We saw fulfilled prophecy was another means by which we know the Bible is the Word of God. But here is the fulfillment of that promise. God comes down to earth. Uh, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Now, Matthew was not saying here, as some might think, 
that God was visiting us in his mercy in the sense that he was being mindful of us and of our condition and he sent a savior into the world though he certainly is doing that he is certainly showing us mercy in this case but what he is telling us through the prophet Isaiah is that he was with us bodily in the Lord Jesus Christ the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him in bodily form now we've already considered some of the evidence for Jesus deity I think I told you when we did that when we were looking at the Trinity and we were going to revisit that and look at some more evidence um, and that's what I want us to do this morning because we really need to be fortified we really need to be grounded in this particular truth for at least two reasons the first one is because only I mean this is the only Jesus that exists okay he's the only one who can save us and in order to have a Jesus who can save us he has to be this Jesus as I mentioned before you can't believe in Jesus the uh, taxi driver who uh, is down in Tijuana let's say driving driving taxis he can't save you uh, only the one who is the God man can actually save you and that's why it's important uh, that you believe that he is but secondly if we don't understand that he is that will make us particularly vulnerable to the enemy's lies now I want to remind you that there are several cults that believe that Jesus is only a man and that he is not God for instance Islam sees him as merely a great prophet the Jehovah's Witnesses see him as some kind of a savior but he's an angel that was made into a man and is now an angel again but he's certainly not God uh, deism believes in a God who exists but who is withdrawn from his creation so he's not involved in the creation by sending us a savior and certainly liberalism the churches that historically were Christian but fell away from supernaturalism but wanted to keep up the trappings of religion they're continuing to use the same words that we use and preach sermons the way that we might preach them although certainly you know the more feel-good type and uh, sort of stroking the backs of their hearer kind of a sermon and neighbor helping neighbor and let's just all live together in love and peace but when they talk about Jesus they are not talking about even a person that may necessarily have existed but if he did exist he certainly was not God many who have converted to the Watchtower Society the Jehovah's Witnesses actually started off as Trinitarians now Jehovah's Witnesses love to attack this truth and they're the ones we need to watch out for I think more than just about any other because they're the ones that come to our doors they're the ones who leave their publications you know the what is it the Watchtower and, and Awake magazine and if you've ever looked at those flyers they that they leave at your door the one thing that is inevitably in every single issue is an attack on the Trinity now those who are not grounded in the Bible and on what it teaches about Jesus can easily be deceived because the Jehovah's Witnesses are so well trained they are targeting that very thing when they come to, to your door if you are a believing Christian they will attack the Trinity they will attack the deity of Christ that's where you're going to spend most of your time so we need to be grounded in this truth if we are to stand firm ourselves but also if we are to help them because as long as they believe that Jesus is a creature and of course that they're saved by works and that the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force as long as they believe all of these things they are still under their sins they are still going to go to hell and they're still going to be leading lots of people to hell now I know that it's inconvenient to talk to Jehovah's Witnesses I know what that's like I know the arguments nobody likes to argue but as Peter Barnes who was a Jehovah's Witness for virtually his whole life in his late 50s converted to Christianity who had been a very you know up in the hierarchy of the Jehovah's Witnesses said on one occasion that of the thousands and thousands of doors that he had gone to in his life as a Jehovah's Witness he said he could count on two hands the number of people who actually tried to minister the gospel to him this was in the UK but I imagine things are no different uh, here so we do need to think about their need and not see them so much as enemies when they come to the door but see them as people who are in need of salvation and believe me you can get them to crack because there's usually the more mature and the less mature and 
you can maybe not affect the one who's really brainwashed, but maybe you can affect the other ones in the process of being brainwashed. So we need to know these truths so we can argue them. Now, I'm not going to review everything we saw, but I do want us to see a few things and, and go a little bit deeper into this particular subject. Now, in the Bible, we see, obviously, Jesus is called God. You think that would be enough, but it's, but it's not for them. But we need to make sure, again, we don't get deceived by their belief system. Now, let's look again at John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, we're not going to get, go into every verse in this much detail, but I did want to point this out because this is the one we're most apt to bring up first, and this is the one they are most likely or the one they're most trained to defend from their perspective. But this is what John writes in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Here we see a distinction of persons. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. I mean, he's dwelling in eternity in the beginning with God, and he is said to be God. Now, what could be clearer than that? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses are going to object, and they're going to say that, that if you were able to see the Greek here, that uh, before the word God, when it says the word was God, there is no definite article. Definite article is the word the. The indefinite article is the word a or a certain or something like that. You notice the word was God. So they say this should be translated that the word was a God. Jesus is a God, that he is not the almighty God. Now, first of all, they don't understand the Greek language. There's, there's a basic rule in the Greek language that says, and here we need to have a little bit of grammatical background, that when you have two nouns that are connected by a form of the word to be, that both of them are in the nominative case, which means in the nominative case that's usually the subject, and if you have a regular type of sentence that doesn't have a form of to be but has an action word, you'll have the subject and you'll have you know, the direct object. But in this case, you have a subject and a predicate. If you say the boy was nice, okay, you're predicating nice to the boy. Well, the problem is in the Greek, you have these, both of these words are in the same case, which is how you determine which is the subject and which is the predicate, but when you have a form of to be, they're both in the same case. So the question is, which is the subject and which of these two words is being predicated of the subject? Is it, you know, the word was God or God was the word? You know, how do you arrange it? Well, in, in Greek, you show the subject by using the definite article and you show the predicate by leaving the definite article out. So what it's saying is the word who is the subject was God in the fullest sense and the definite article is not being used because it's the predicate in this particular sentence. Now, further, uh, I, let, me just, let me just give you a few further examples. Some nouns are definite enough not to need the definite article. That's another argument. You may not always find them, let's say, before proper names, like Peter or John or something. If you see Peter, sometimes the definite article will be there, sometimes it won't, but why not? It's because everybody knows who Peter is. You know, when you talk about Peter, we know who he is. It's not the Peter. You don't have to distinguish him from other Peters, so you don't have to use the definite article. Well, in this case, how definite is God? How many gods are there? There's only one. So if the word can only apply to one possible being, you don't always have to use the definite article. Now, again, these are just arguments that we can use. Now, if they were consistent in their method of translation, they would also have to translate other verses consistently with that methodology. Now, let's try that on a few other verses that occur in John chapter 1. For instance, John chapter 1, verse 6. There came a man sent from a God whose name was John. The definite article isn't there. According to their methodology, it should be translated this way. No, we don't find the definite article in verses 12 and 13 either, where John says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of a God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of a God. 
Now, Jehovah's Witnesses do not translate these verses this way because they know these verses are referring to the Almighty God, and yet they do the, they they will uh, they won't give verse one the same consideration. So they're inconsistent with their Greek, but they're consistent in their denial of Jesus' deity because in in their minds and in their belief system everything depends on the fact that Jesus is not God. And they will virtually go, you know, to the nth degree to try to prove that. That's why we need the Spirit of God, of course, to break through, but he does it through the truth. Now, one further point that we can bring up and perhaps an easier one than this other argument that I just gave you. How many gods does the Bible actually teach? Okay, it's only one, only one true God. Well, what are all the other gods according to the Bible? They are false gods. Uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 96, verse 5, For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Now, if Jesus is a God, but he is not the true God, then what does that make him? That makes him a false god. That makes him an idol. But they will not admit that. So the fact is, he either has to be the true God or he's a false God. You cannot have it any other way. Now, so Jesus is called God, okay? We saw that Jesus also does the works of God. Remember, he's the one who creates in verse 3 of John chapter 1. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus shares the attributes of God. He's eternal, and he never changes. I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, where the author to the Hebrews is quoting Psalm 102. It's clearly referring to Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. But the author to the Hebrews applies it to Jesus. And this is what he says. He says, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Now I want you to notice a couple things here. First of all, Jesus is the creator. He's the one who founded the earth, the heavens are the works of his hands. Secondly, he is eternal. You, Lord, in the beginning did this. Now we saw that in John chapter 1 as well. Jesus was in the beginning. Now the only being that can exist in the beginning is God because he's the only one that exists outside of time. And notice thirdly that though everything he created will change, even the heavens are going to be rolled up like, a, you know, like an old garment, they'll be rolled up and so forth. The author says Jesus will never change. He always remains the same. Now, there's one thing that is true about a creature, and that is a creature always changes. There was a Greek philosopher by the name of Heraclitus. Uh, there was Parmenides and Heraclitus. They were kind of contemporaries, and they had this ongoing argument. But Heraclitus is, is most often uh, remembered for his, his belief that everything that he saw was in a state of universal flux. And what he meant by that is everything is constantly changing, right? His, his famous statement was, you cannot step into the same river twice because when you step in it the first time, the river is a certain way. And then when you step in it the second time, it's changed. I mean, certain things about it have changed. Water's been running through it. Sand has moved. And there's things that are, that are not in the same position they were in before. Even the molecules of water, everything is constantly changing. Now, the point here is this. We are creatures. And the creation is a creature. And because we're creatures, we are always changing. Heraclitus was right. We, we change uh, from the time we're conceived to the time we're born. When we're born, we, we change as we grow up. As we uh, reach full maturity and so forth, at least physically, then we start growing older, but we're always changing. We're always learning things. We're changing in certain ways. And we're going to continue to change through life. And as a matter of fact, in heaven, we're still going to continue to change. We're going to learn more things. We're going to grow in our blessedness in heaven. 
as we learn more and more about God. So we're going to be changing for the rest of time, which is endless. But notice the author to the Hebrews says that that is not true about Jesus. Jesus is the same. He will not change. And the reason why he won't is because he is God, because God is the only one who does not change. And we also saw that Jesus is worshipped as God. Remember in Matthew 28, 9, And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. This is after his resurrection. When they met him at the mountain, he told them to meet the man. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Only God is to be worshipped. Any other, well, any creature that was worshipped in the Bible, immediately when they were worshipped, that they weren't wicked to begin with and wanted that worship, which is false worship, if they were righteous and did the right thing, like John, when he fell at the feet of the angel and worshipped him, he was so overcome by the vision that the Lord had showed him in the book of Revelation, the angel said, get up on your feet. I'm just a fellow servant like you are. Worship God. You see, now Jesus, if he were a mere creature, would have said the same thing. If he were righteous, which we know he is, to his disciples when they worshipped him, but he did not. He received that worship. Now here's one other argument that I think is, is noteworthy. John writes in John chapter 1, verse 18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Now if you look at this passage, you understand that what John is saying is that nobody has seen the Father at any time. But the only begotten God, who is Jesus, in the bosom of the Father, he is the one who has shown us what he is like. Now, Jesus is called the only begotten God, which sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? But not when we understand that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. Remember, he is eternally begotten of the Father. That's why he's called the Son. And he is said to be in the bosom of the Father, not because the Father's bosom is everywhere and Jesus is in that bosom, but because he loves him. He's in his affections. He's the one whom he loves. Now, John tells us that Jesus came into the world that he might explain God to show us what God is like. Jesus said to Philip, when Philip asked Jesus to show him, to show really all the disciples, the Father, Jesus responds in John 14, verse 9, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Now, again, Jesus was not saying he was the Father, but that he shares the same nature as the Father, so that to see him was to see the Father. Now, getting back to the point, though, you know, Jesus came into the world to reveal the Father, but nobody has seen the Father. Now, we don't often think about this, but Jesus, in his work of revealing the Father, is, this is something he has been doing, not just since he came into the world, but something he was doing from the very beginning, long before he became a man. Now, he revealed the Father by sending the Spirit into the world and by inspiring the Scriptures and so forth. That's a revelation of God. But he also came into the world before the Incarnation in another form to reveal what God is like. I mean, can you think of any instances in the Old Testament where God appeared to his people. Remember, no one has seen the Father at any time, and yet God came down and revealed himself to his people. So who was this person? Now, one instance of this, of course, that perhaps the most obvious one is the angel of the Lord. Who is the angel of the Lord? Well, as we read about him, it's clear that he is no mere angel. We read in Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2, that God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, who it is that is telling Abraham to do this, who is calling him to make this sacrifice. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. But Abraham does. He, he obeys the Lord instantly. He packs up his, his animals. He takes Isaac there. 
He arranges the wood. Isaac asks, where is the sacrifice? Abraham says, God's going to provide a sacrifice for himself. He binds Isaac, puts him on the wood, raises his hand. He's going to stab him. He's going to kill him because he knows that God promised that it was through Isaac his descendants would be named. Isaac had not gotten married. Isaac had no children. He knew that Isaac had to live. Isaac had to have children. And even if he should kill him, God was going to raise him again from the dead to fulfill his promise. That is how much faith Abraham had in God. But before he killed Isaac, we read uh, this, that the angel of the Lord stopped him and commended him for not withholding Isaac from him. Now, I want you to notice the angel of the Lord is the one who stops him. And the angel of the Lord says, you have not withheld him from me. But it was God who called him to sacrifice his son. We read in Genesis 22, 11 and 12. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Okay? God is the one who said, I want you to sacrifice your son. Abraham is willing to do it. The angel of the Lord said, I know you fear God now because you have not withheld your son from me. The angel of the Lord clearly is identified here as God. Now we read in a few verses later, in verses 15 through 18, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. That's Yahweh. Okay, this is Yahweh speaking, but it's the angel of the Lord who is calling from heaven. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed, I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is the angel of the Lord speaking. He calls himself Yahweh. He is the God who called Abraham to do this. He is the one who says he's going to bless Abraham, which is exactly what Yahweh said he was going to do back in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. The angel of the Lord is Yahweh. He is the covenant God of Israel. Now, those who saw this angel also knew that when they did, that they had seen God. We read in Judges 13, 21 through 22, where the angel of the Lord appears to Manoah and his wife to tell them about the judge that, that, that she's going to bear, which is Samson. But let's just abbreviate and read this portion. Now the angel of the Lord did not appear to Manoah or his wife again. After they offered a sacrifice, he um, put his staff into it, a fire went up, and, and this angel of the Lord ascended in the fire back to heaven. They didn't see him again, Okay, he didn't appear to him, them again. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. So Manoah said to his wife, we will surely die, for we have seen God. And they were talking about the angel. Now, let me just come back to our previous point. We read earlier that no one has seen the Father at any time. So the question is, who is this angel? Who is God? And who is Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, if he's not the Father? Well, he is the only begotten God that the Father has sent to reveal him. He was the Son of God in his pre-incarnate state. As a matter of fact, when you understand this, then when you go back to the Garden of Eden, who is it that walked with Adam and Eve in the Garden if nobody had seen the Father? It was the Son of God. He was there in his pre-incarnate state. He's God. He's fellowshipping with his creation, with his people. He was walking with him in the garden in the same way that one day we will walk with Jesus in heaven because we have trusted in him. Now, there's many other ways the Bible clearly shows that Jesus is God. Let me just give you one last verse, and that, that was in our recent uh, Reading the Bible Together books in 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. I don't know if you caught this when you were reading through this. It says this, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not our God and our Savior, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the Greek, that is how 
this sentence fits together. He is our Savior, and He is also our God. So who is Jesus? Well, He's first of all God the Son, second person of the triune God. And if we deny this, we deny the true Jesus, the only one who can save us. And we exclude ourselves from God's kingdom. Jesus said to the Jews on another occasion in John 8, 24, which is not in the slides necessarily, just a brief quote. He says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. I am is what Yahweh means. The name of the covenant God of Israel. Jesus says, unless you believe that I am Yahweh, you will die in your sins. So again, Jesus, I mean, there, it, the Bible is shot through with evidence. You, you need to be fortified in this. And the reason why I'm, I'm really emphasizing this is not because we haven't heard this, but I, I'm just surprised by people who have been in Christian churches for years who still are not convinced that Jesus is God. Uh, somebody I knew very, very close to me after many, many years in the church was saying, I, I really question whether that's the case, but if he had been exposed to teaching in this area, perhaps had seen this in the Bible, he wouldn't be so easily dissuaded. Satan is trying to rip that idea out of your mind. He's done it with the Jehovah's Witnesses as well as other precious truths, and he's condemned them to hell. We don't want to allow him to do that to us, and he really can't do that to us if we truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not want to be deceived, though. So now there's a couple of other points, and they're going to be briefer, but we do need to get through these. Secondly, he is also man. He calls himself the Son of Man. That's a messianic title. But he also means that he is one with us. Remember we saw a little bit earlier the Docetists, who were an early heretical group in the church and even existed during the time of the writing of the New Testament, denied that Jesus had become a man because they believed according to the Greek philosophy, that everything that was material was evil. And so Jesus could not be made of physical matter because he would be evil. Well, John tells us to deny his humanity is to also destroy the gospel and to render ourselves incapable of salvation. He had to be God and he had to be man. John writes in 1 John 4, verses 2 and 3, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming and now it is already in the world. This is also something upon which our salvation is based. It's fundamental. Jesus had to be God and he had to be man. Now, we looked earlier at Genesis 3.15. I think we'll skip the reading of that, where the Son of God was said one day he would become a man. Remember the seed of the woman? It's going to crush the head of the serpent. Jesus is the seed of the woman, and he would become part of the human race that he might destroy our enemy. We see this promise developed through Scripture as we were singing the hymn El Shaddai, remember? We see that he was going to come through Abraham's family. These terms El Shaddai and so forth come from an incident in Abraham's uh, life. But uh, we read earlier in Genesis 22, verse 18, the promise to Abraham from the angel of the Lord. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you obeyed my voice. Well, who is that seed that he was referring to? Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, it's referring to Jesus. He is the seed of Abraham, which means he is connected to Abraham's race. He is a part of the human race. Still later, we see he's going to come through the line of David. We read in 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. This Messiah, who is, again, God with us, He's going to be a part of David's line, of the tribe of Judah, the family of David, so he would have a right to rule. But now to become a part of our race and not be affected by the sin we saw last week, that Adam's sin corrupted all of us and made us all guilty, Jesus had to come into the world in a unique way. So we read again in our passage. 
Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that she had been chosen to be the, the mother of Jesus, we read that Mary said to the angel in Luke 1, verses 34 and 35, How can this be? Since I am a virgin, the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Now, he is the Son of God in two senses. He is conceived by the Holy Spirit. That makes him the Son of God, which means even his humanity is the Son of God. But the Holy Spirit was making a connection between the person of the eternal Son of God and the person of that, of that man, which is the same person. He's the one who, as it were, makes that connection between the personality and, as it were, puts that personality within that human nature. So it is the eternal Son of God who is actually being conceived here. Now, the virgin birth, that Jesus came into the world in this way through a supernatural conception, is foundational to the gospel. And it's foundational for at least three reasons, because it was prophesied, because if Jesus had not been born in this way, he would have been guilty like the rest of us. He would have come into the world guilty and corrupt and he could not save us and he could not save himself if that were the case. His supernatural conception by the Holy Spirit saved him from Adam's sin and the work of the Holy Spirit sanctified him in the womb and gave him a heart that was purely and completely devoted to his father. So the virgin birth was important so he wouldn't come into the world corrupt and guilty, but he also needed to be connected to our race. He had to be one with us. Paul writes in Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. The word born of a woman means born out of a woman, born of her substance. He is connected to us. He's a part of the same race that we are the race that's fallen, the race that needs to be saved. You know that Jesus can only save this race? There's only one race, the human race, right? He can only save us because he became one with us. He didn't become one with the angels. He can't save the angels for that reason. He has to be connected. He has to make the payment from our side. And that's, again, what we're going to look at in just, just in closing. But Jesus is fully God. He is a divine person, the person of the, of the man Christ Jesus is a divine person, but he is also fully man. He took upon himself all of our limitations and weaknesses, was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. The only thing that is different is that he is not a sinner. He has a pure and holy heart. And then finally and very briefly, why did he need to be God and man? Well, he needed to be a man to represent us, as I said before, in the covenant of redemption. We're going to look at this more fully tonight. We sinned. We owed the debt. The Father intended to save us and not angels, so the Son of Man had to become one with us so that he might be able to do what was necessary to bring the blessing of eternal life down to us. But he also needed to be God because only God, there's really a few reasons here, only God, and this, this is a disputed point, but I, I think that it's true, only one who is God could have done what he did with regard to obedience. He had to be God in order to obey the Father flawlessly. I mean, why do I say that? Well, we had a perfect man and woman in the garden, didn't we? And they failed. A perfect man is not enough. You need more. He is the God-man. Jesus could not fail. He needed to be God because only God could pay what we owed to the justice of God. Remember, God is infinitely holy and worthy, and we've sinned against him. The penalty is, is infinite punishment. The debt is limitless, and we can't pay that. But one who is infinitely worthy can, and he did. That's why Jesus had to be God as well as man. And the third reason is because only God could endure the wrath of God. Remember that Jesus was fully man, but a, but a man could not endure the wrath of God on the cross. It would have obliterated him. So how was it that Jesus was able to hold together undergoing the wrath that he suffered? It's because his divine nature 
sustained him. He had to be God in order to survive. And then the last reason is because of, think about this, think about all the honor, think about all the praise, think about all the thanksgiving that we owe to Jesus for doing what he did. Could we feasibly owe all of that to a creature, to a man who is a mere creature? You see, God is to receive all the glory for our salvation. So the one who did this work was God, had to be God, so that he could be praised for what he did. Now tonight we're going to look at what it is that Jesus did. But for now, as we prepare to come to the table, let's remember who this one is who gave his life for us. Who this, I mean, can you imagine if you were at the Last Supper and Jesus had girded himself and got down on his hands and knees with a bowl of water and was going to wash your feet? He did much more than that. I mean, he descended into hell for us, essentially, on the cross. He took our place in judgment on the cross. He, he became the, 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 the object of his Father's wrath for us. And the one who did it is God in our nature. He was willing to do that for us. That's what the table reminds us of this morning. So let's close with that and let's bow for just a moment of prayer and, and let's ask the Lord to, um, well, to be thankful and to realize who the, our Savior is, to be fortified in our understanding of this so that we're not only grounded in it ourselves, but we can help others. But let's also, as we bow, remember that the table that he gives us here this morning is a holy table. And we need to make sure before we would come to the table that we love the Lord Jesus, that we're trusting him, that we love him more than life. I mean, he is the absolute center, that we're really here because we love him. We love to hear his truth. We love to worship him. Let, let's just pray that, that the Lord would show us ourselves and whether or not we should come to the table. Let, let's pray, shall we?